Pamela Sullivan. Uh, she is professor at the Oregon State uh, University. Her research focuses on uh, developing and understanding how terrestrial water storage and water quality are influenced by humans uh, and by climatic perturbations. And the title of Pam's talk is uh, Are Rate Changes in um, Biotic Processes Altering Subsurface Hydrologic uh, Partitioning in the Anthropocene? And with that, I'm going to give the floor to Pam. Well, good morning, everyone. While I get my uh, sh screen shared, um, I'm, I'm assuming everyone can hear and see everything. So I, I modified my title a little bit this morning to make it something a little more tangible. But this is a question, um, and I think maybe it, we don't have an answer to this question. And in my opinion, it's, it might be something that's exciting for you all to think about as, um, as you move through this, this meeting. And it's something I've been thinking about with a whole cast of characters, as you can see at the bottom, faculty members and postdocs and graduate students and undergraduate students. And what we're asking is, is, is subsurface plumbing responding to climate and land use change in the Anthropocene? And I want to take a second and I want you to think, does it, if it is changing, does it matter? Would you want to be able to bring that into your models? Now, the idea behind this is that we have uh, climate change that's taking place in the Anthropocene. We know that land cover has been changing. Our atmospheric uh, concentrations of CO2 are rising, which can have cascading biotic effects. And so can the eutrophication that's occurring across our landscapes. So we're asking the question, are all of these processes altering that subsurface structure? And if they alter that subsurface structure, what we have taking place is the potential for changes in the hydraulic properties of our soils and our regolith, changes in the preferential flow paths of those systems, and then we also have then changes in the depth distribution of the organic carbon in these systems. These feed back to then influence potentially the storage of water on terrestrial earth. It's partitioning between different compartments of the near surface and the groundwaters. This impact impacts the functioning and distribution of our microbial communities in these environments. And that functioning and that distribution then feeds back to influence those hydraulic properties and to influence the rate at which dissolved organic carbon is um, being decomposed. These then therefore interact together, right? The way that water flows, the way that carbon cycled to alter the propensity of weathering which feeds back into our climate systems. But just in and of itself, that water storage has the potential to impact our climates as well. So the premise of this, um, of this talk is kind of based on one fact, that the distribution of pores in our subsurface govern the way that water flows. And that if you change that distribution of pores, you change that flow path, you change those water residence times, you change water mineral interactions, and therefore you can change water chemistry. This is a figure by Li Shen Zhen. It's a great one because it depicts macropore presence that could be influencing vertical flow, but it also uh, shows the interaction between horizons and horizon boundaries that can help to support lateral flow in the subsurface as well. So the interactions of these different kinds of uh, properties of our soil can begin to actually change the way that water flows through it. So if we take a really simplified approach to this, we can say, okay, well, are there changes that are taking place in our landscape such that they change the proportion of interflow and the proportion of groundwater recharge such that they might even impact the chemistry and the water quantities and the timing of those to our streams themselves. Now, this is a, a simple character, um, a simple figure by Lili, uh, but I think it, it, it helps us to understand these potential impacts that are taking place. Now here, this is one example from the Coal Creek. Um, it's in Gunnison, Colorado, so not far from at least the, the land lab area right now. Um, and 
What we're looking at here are concentrations of two constituents, dissolved organic carbon on the top and magnesium on the bottom. And what's been observed as we had this decline in this environment of 40% snow cover over the last 20 plus years is a change in the concentrations of dissolved organic carbon making it into the streams. And here that's about a tripling or quadrupling, but we haven't seen it in some of the geogenic species like magnesium, but we have seen it in things like iron and manganese. And so there's a question here, is this simply just a biogeochemical um, cycle that is changing or is it a relationship to a change in flow paths in the system that are delivering different solutes to the system? And so we're taking modeling approaches to start thinking about that. Now, there are other observations that are taking place that have shown us that soil structure is changing and it, it may be changing rapidly, at least in the last 50 years, if maybe not even in the last couple of decades. So this is work by Daniel Hermes, 48,000 pedons from the Natural Resource Conservation Service. He used that with uh, the changes in our past precipitation of the last 50 years to examine the soil structure and its response to changes in mean annual precipitation. What was observed here is that we have mean annual precipitation regressed against mean residual effective porosity. Now that residual effective porosity means that we've actually taken it and we've been able to um, normalize it for clay content and for organic matter content and then look to see what's driving these changes or how it relates to mean annual precipitation. And we see that in the A horizons and the B horizons, it declines, that effective porosity, with increasing mean annual precipitation. Now, you could say to me, okay, well, this could happen over very long time periods as these soils are forming. But what we see is that in uh, soils that have been plowed recently, that this rearrangement of fabric is also taking place. If we use this idea of fabric being rearranged as a result of changes in our climate or mean annual precipitation, and we run that out into the future to 2100, we can then begin to think, what does that mean for our saturated hydraulic conductivity, the way that water flows through the system? We could look at an area like the Pacific Northwest, where I live right now, and what you can see is that you could have a reduction in saturated hydraulic conductivity by up to 60%. Now, polar structure isn't only changing near the surface. We have evidence that's from the Shale Hills Critical Zone Observatory, but also other places like the Snake River, which is showing that they may also be sensitive at depths to changes in groundwater table dynamics. So here's just some drill core material going all the way down to 20 meters. When we're at depth, we see this presence of pyrite framboids. As we move to the surface, we see the opening of porosity and slight infilling of iron oxides. In this environment, this location where this transition occurs, we call that the pyrite reaction front, is actually governed by the position of where we have deep dissolved uh, rich um, permanent interflow, which is rich in dissolved oxygen. And then we have our regional groundwater, which is low in dissolved oxygen. Where these interact, these young waters and these old waters actually governs that boundary that's there. And so we can think to ourselves, well, over time, if, if our incoming precipitation changes, if our land cover changes in these environments, or if pumping in some environment changes, and changes the interaction of these water table dynamics, then we could have cascading effects on the generation of porosity at depth. Now, it's not only just the idea that we have changes in our, our uh, structure that are, are resulting maybe from mean annual precipitation or changes in water table dynamics, but we also see that there's something very powerful that's been changing in the Anthropocene. And that's the potential that rooting depth has been changing globally. So this is work by a PhD student, Emma Hauser at the University of Kansas. Here, what you're looking at is a comparison of rooting depth distributions pre-Anthropocene and rooting depth distributions now. You'll see in the red, we're getting to shallower roots. In the blue, we're getting to deeper roots. And what it demonstrates to us, at least since the start of the Anthropocene, is we have shallowed roots by 16 centimeters globally. But if we run that on into the future to 2100, what we find is that even given different kinds of climate scenarios, we will still be shallowing by another 60 centimeters globally. 
Now, these roots are really important because they help to support potentially up to 70% of the macropores that are in our soils. So those macropores that we have are about 50 nanometers or bigger in size, and they are what helps to transport our liquids, small particles, and our gases in these systems. So if we take kind of a conceptual image of this, we can think to ourselves, well, macropores themselves, they only represent 2% of the soil volume or rigorous volume, but they actually in control 70% of the water flow potentially fits through those. So we have to ask the question, as our landscapes change, right? Let's say we have a woodied environment and that woody environment changes. We have some macropores that are left behind. What does it actually mean as our land cover itself changes does it actually alter the hydraulic partitioning of these environments? So there's some other kinds of fun um, uh, research that's coming to light right now. And this is uh, work done by Sharon Billings Lab at the Calhoun Critical Zone Observatory. And she puts forward what she calls the below ground Rudderman hypothesis. And in this, what we, what we state is that the Anthropocene's modification to rooting networks and ecosystems imparts structural and biogeochemical signatures deep within rigorous profiles. Now we know that we can change things near the surface if we change our land cover. But what, she's, what we're showing here is that here in the old growth system compared to uh, this agriculture and a regenerating pine in this environment, we see that we have at depth two meters really large differences in the rooting densities of these environments. But we also see really large differences in the actual um, chemistry and the biogeochemical processes that might be taking place. So I'll, I'll bring your eye over here to these hardwood uh, uh, systems. And what we see is that the organic acid con concentration compared to the soil organic carbon content is much greater in these at depth in these environments compared to regenerating pine and agriculture. So we have this potential for, for stimulating more weathering in the system down here. In addition, what we see is that at least at two meters of depth, 22% more um, modern carbon at depth here in this hardwood system than compared to what you might have in regenerating pines or agricultural systems. So it, it indicates to us there's these large changes that are potentially taking place in the subsurface, not only in terms of its physical structure, but its biogeochemical interactions as well. So this is work that's been done by uh, my PhD student, Aaron uh, Koop. And here we're trying to ask the question, okay, to what degree do these soils start to even matter to our climate system themselves? And so using that same NRCS database and, and conglomerating it using HUC6 levels, he looked to say, okay, well, each of these watersheds or each of these HUC6 levels and basins that we see, how far do they fall away from the Boudicca curve? So how much are they able to meet their evaporative demand? And we said, okay, well, that distance that they fall away from this um, empirical curve, can we explain that actually using the information about the soils themselves? And so when we analyze this data, what, we, what is revealed is that soil structure, which is the roundness and the solidity and the organic carbon content, along with the aridity index, is able to help explain about 50% of the deviation away from that Boudicca curve. So it's giving us this hint, right, that these soils are playing such an important role potentially in governing what's taking place in our climates. So the question is, do these changes to the critical zone subsurface feedback to govern climate? So before we had our, our pre-Anthropocene kind of condition, right, we had one rooting network, we had a hydrologic cycle that was taking place in one, one manner, we moved forward into the Anthropocene. In some places, we've shallowed our roots. In some places, we've deepened our roots. And we can take a look and ask the question, well, what does that mean, that rooting depth distribution in this instance, to the degree of coupling to our atmosphere and to the critical zone weathering engine? And we might, we might theorize, right, that as we change those rooting depth distributions, we actually shift the degree of coupling between our atmosphere and that weathering engine. So the question is, is this important for climate projections? So I'm going to open it up for questions and thank you very much and let you know about a couple of upcoming opportunities.